Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming along this morning. My name is Greg Lyon. I'm a former chair of Greens List, and welcome to the Greens List breakfast seminar on sentencing. Um, we've got three terrific speakers today. We've got Trevor Raitt, a very senior junior on the list, um, uh, speaking about gross violence. We have Karen Argyropoulos, who's been on the list now for three or four years uh, since coming from the DPP and WorkSafe, speaking about baseline sentencing. And we have one of our new list members, Nikki Mollard, uh, new but still very experienced, an academic at Monash, who's going to speak about the abolition of suspended sentences. Now, as we all know, the sentencing uh, landscape has changed enormously and remains uh, in a state of change uh, since the uh, new government came in on the uh, 27th of November 2010. The reforms that they have promised and are delivering are indeed, uh, we think, quite uh, radical. Um, but history shows that uh, suspended sentences have come and gone, as you'll hear from, from Nikki. So let's find out more about the brave new world in which we are to enter. And Trevor, you're going to speak first on gross violence. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, <clears throat> the Crimes Amendment Gross Violence Offences Act 2013 uh, was enacted on the 1st of July this year and is in place. And I understand there are there have been a couple of charges already. Has anyone had any punters charged with one of these offences yet? No? We, we believe the OPP has information that some people have been charged. Either way, the main thrust of it is to introduce uh, changes to the Sentencing Act so that uh, a person convicted of a, an offence of gross violence uh, will face a minimum four-year uh, non-parole period. The other significant change is that it changes the definitions of injury and serious injury, and that has application across the board uh, in the other Crimes Act offences. I'll, the paper is fairly uh, self-explanatory, and the Act is is relatively, the changes are relatively straightforward. So I just want to focus on a couple of matters which um, may be of interest to you that I've identified um, in the Act, uh, which may give, give you something to think about if you have a, uh, a client charged with one of these offences. Firstly, the definitions. The previous definition, as you know, of injury included unconsciousness, hysteria, pain, and any substantial Oh, sorry, any substantial impairment of bodily function. Serious injury, of course, was a, a bit vaguer and uh, included a combination of injuries. And it was often subject to debate about whether the injury that your client uh, was alleged to have inflicted amounted to a serious injury. The new meaning, um, injury means physical injury or harm to mental health, whether temporary or permanent. And that's broken down further. Physical injury includes unconsciousness, disfigurement, substantial pain, uh, infection with a disease and an impairment of bodily function. Harm to mental health includes psychological harm but does not include an emotional reaction such as distress, grief, fear, anger, unless those matters can be proved to be related to causing the psychological harm. Serious injury, on the other hand, is an injury that either endangers life or is substantial and protracted. Now, this is where the bar is raised higher for the Crown to prove a serious injury and really paints a whole new picture for serious injury. In dangerous life, well, that may be not that difficult to allege. If they allege the other, or if it's said that the injury is substantial and protracted, the act, their conjunctive words, it must be both. And I suppose what you might want to ask yourself if you have a client charged with a serious injury offence, 
of any sort, gross violence or otherwise, is how could the police know at the time of charging that that injury will be protracted? And how then, if that is the case, does the Crown prove that you had such an intention to cause a substantial and protracted injury? So I wonder whether if you do have someone charged with one of these offences, a serious injury offence, whether it might be better to ask the Crown for further and better particulars to say, well, how do you put the serious injury in this case? Now, tactically, that might be done early on. And if they nail their colour to the mask and say, well, we say it's a substantial and protracted injury, you may have something to argue at trial. Um, alternatively, you could hold off and wait till trial and raise these arguments because it really does, in my view, change the threshold for serious injury and indeed the explanatory memorandum to this legislation says as much and that's the intention. The definition requires more than a combination of relatively minor injuries which you could do in the past. Um, the commentaries often quote a uh, decision of Welsh and Flynn where cuts, swollen lip, bruising to eyes um, etc in, in combination may be considered to be a serious injury. But this overrules those decisions. Uh, in this, under this legislation, that sort of circumstance would not constitute a serious injury. So, so there's some, some significant changes, and I, I think you should keep that in mind if your client is charged under these sections or under the older uh, other sections in the Act with serious injury or injury, because it may give you a further uh, defence uh, or argument certainly at trial to discount or disprove serious injury. Um, as to the gross violence um, part of legislation, there are two new offences, uh, 15A2 and, sorry, 15A and 15B. And the Act, uh, 15A is causing uh, serious injury intentionally in circumstances of gross violence and 15B is the reckless version of that. The rest of the, uh, of the sections, of the section is the same, it mirrors each other. That is, the circumstances in which the gross violence occurs are the same for, for each. Um, so there's a number, there's that the offender planned in advance to engage in the conduct and there are a couple of, of um, subsections to that. I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, the offender in company with two or more other persons caused the injury. Um, the offender participated in a joint criminal enterprise with two or more. Uh, planned in advance to have with him, him or her an offensive weapon, firearm, and in fact used that weapon. Uh, and then there's the two circumstances of where you cause someone to become incapacitated and continue to cause injury or indeed cause injury to someone who is already incapacitated. In other words, not the incapacitation was not caused by you necessarily, but you attack someone in that circumstance. In relation to the, um, to the planning, subsection, the offender planned in advance to engage in conduct and at the time of planning intended the conduct would cause serious injury, reckless or reckless to whether the con conduct would cause serious injury and that a reasonable person would have foreseen that that conduct would result, would likely result in serious injury. Now, in my view, it, take, it breaks the, um, the elements down further, so there are now two elements to this offence. The prosecution has to prove that the offender had a particular state of mind at the time of planning <coughs> to commit an offence. So, um, and at the time of planning, you can have an intention to go out and inflict serious injury or be reckless to whether that's going to occur. In addition to that, um, they, have to, they have to prove that you have a particular state of mind at the time of engaging in the conduct. So the two stages of mind occur at different points in time. They do not need to be the same. So one could be reckless and one obviously could be, uh, needs to be intentional if it's charged under that first section. Uh, 
Um, so, for example, under a, a 15A offence, causing injury intentionally in circumstances of gross violence, um, the, what would satisfy the offence was if the offender planned in advance to engage in conduct and at the time was reckless as to whether that planned conduct would cause a serious injury and at the time of committing the act, uh, the serious injury was caused and the offender intended to cause the serious injury at that time. And indeed, uh, the explanatory memorandum to this Act is quite good in that it goes further than just repeating the sections which they often do, and, and it acknowledges that circumstance. The other change which um, is relevant is that the Act inserts a new Section 422 into the Crimes Act, uh, which allows for an alternative verdict in a case where someone is charged with a 15A or 15B offence, the alternatives being intentionally causing serious injury or recklessly causing serious injury under section 16, the old section 16 and 17, which continue to exist. The, although the alternative does free the client from the risk of, of, of having the attraction of the statutory minimum, um, it's, it's rather odd that the maximum penalty for these new offences is exactly the same as 16 and 17. So, and in addition to that, the explanatory memorandum states that these new offences involve a particularly high level of harm and culpability. So, it's a strange circumstance, but you will have all had clients, and there's, there's no, noted cases such as Terry and Zullo and those others where in those sorts of cases, someone's attacked uh, a person, they're on the street, unconscious or in a state of incapacitation and, and they've been, had the living daylights kicked out of them. That was the case in both Terry and Zorlo. Now, those sentences are going to well exceed the four-year minimum in any event, where you have those sorts of group attacks or attacks where you've got someone lying on the street, unconscious, and someone's kicking into them. I think Terry they got nine with seven and that was up to 11 with nine, uh, that sort of sentence. So if you've got a punter like that, then what would be the difference if they're convicted of one of these offences and they're going to get more than the four year minimum, should they get more because they're convicted of one of these offences when they carried the same maximum as the other offences? And So that's a rather odd, uh, the same maximum as 16 or 17. Um, it's a rather odd circumstance where you, you exceed the minimum anyway. The legislation doesn't say there's some new approach, some new application of some sort of principle, other than saying this is a really serious form of this offence, um, but carries the same maximum. As to the statutory minimum part of the Act, um, an anomaly exists, in my view, between section 15A to B and C, that is those two sections I spoke about before acting in company or participating in a joint criminal enterprise, because the new section 10 in the Sentencing Act that introduces this, uh, the, the mandatory minimum, says that uh, creates certain exemptions, and one of those is that a person who aids, abets, counsels or procures does not attract the, the four year minimum. <coughs> Now, I, I, again, it's an anomaly which is strange, but the difference may well be because the focus of this uh, legislation seems to be on the group offending, the people that go out in a pack and attack someone. As you know, the prosecution don't have to prove any agreement with aiding and abetting, um, and maybe it's the lack of agreement or well, well, the lack of agreement with, which distinguishes aiding and abetting from other forms of complicity like concert, joint criminal enterprise, extended common purpose. Maybe that's the reason why the legislation has said, well, look, if you only aid and abet, um, although it's odd because you can cer certainly see a circumstance where it can be a very serious group offence where aiding and abetting is, um, is on the cards because just of the, the way it unfolds. But that particular person would be exempt from the application of the four-year minimum. 
So that's another anomaly which I think is going to cause problems for the Crown. Um, and it may well be, again, that if your client is charged with one of these offences, ask the Crown, how do you put the case? Do you say we were acting in concert or joint criminal enterprise, as, as the phrase we now use? Or do you say we're aiding and abetting? And usually the Crown says, oh, we reckon it's both or either, which would be a great answer. Because when, even when you are convicted of this offence, you have a very good argument to say, well, look, the Crown concedes that it's open that this was aiding and abetting. And if so, and if you can't rule it out, this is on a sentencing hearing, then you cannot apply the statutory minimum. And it may well be also that you'd have an abuse argument because if the Crown says, well, yeah, we say aiding and abetting is open on this, and they go ahead and charge this offence, the only reason they could be charging it is so they've got the chance of getting a statutory minimum. But if you've got aiding and abetting as a reasonable argument, you might be able to argue that that's an abusive process and that, they, that that should be removed from the indictment or the alternative put to the jury um, of the lesser offence. Um, I won't say any more for now. There's, I think there are a few questions that, that arise out of that legislation. Hopefully I've identified them. Um, perhaps later I can, if there's any questions, I can try and expand on some of those matters. But um, that's all I have for you for the moment. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm talking to you today about baseline sentencing. And that's essentially um, a scheme where Parliament will prescribe a statutory baseline or a starting point that the courts must then apply in determining the appropriate non-parole period for an offence. The introduction of a baseline sentencing scheme was one of a number of policies relating to sentencing that the uh, Coalition announced in the days prior to its election in 2010. And it really, in my view, represents one of the most radical changes to sentencing that we've seen in this state for a long time. In April 2011, the attorney asked the Sentencing Advisory Council to advise on aspects of this scheme and how it could operate in practice. And SAC published its final report on this topic in May 2012. Unfortunately, the SAC wasn't asked to advise on the merits of the scheme. And true to its terms of reference, the report doesn't address the ultimate question of whether there's utility in such a scheme being introduced in Victoria. And that's despite um, a large number of stakeholders um, expressing um, strong opposition to the introduction of this scheme. And the SAC noticed, noted uh, that opposition in its report. I should say that the uh, government has previously publicly announced that it would introduce legislation to implement a baseline sentencing scheme this year. Uh, obviously that's not likely to happen now in the remainder of the year, but um, from what I hear we can expect that legislation will be introduced in the early part of next year. So how will baseline sentencing work? Well, firstly, the SAC recommended that the scheme should only apply in circumstances where a court has already decided that they're going to impose a sentence of imprisonment and a non-parole period on an offender. To that extent, SAC would say it's not strictly a mandatory sentencing scheme because the court has the discretion in the first place as to whether it's going to impose a custodial sentence at all. The SAC also advised that uh, baseline sentencing should only apply in relation to specific offences when dealt with on indictment in the county and Supreme Courts. Therefore, the scheme won't apply to proceedings that are determined summarily and it won't apply in the Children's Court. SAC also suggested that the scheme shouldn't have application to people who are aged 18 at the time of offending regardless of when they're sentenced. And it also shouldn't apply to people who are aged 18 to 20 at the time of sentence who receive uh, a sentence involving detention in a youth justice centre. 
Uh, as I've said, the scheme is also likely to apply to specific offences which the legislation will define as baseline offences. Therefore, if you're dealing with offences that aren't baseline offences, this scheme won't apply and the usual sentencing regime that we all know and love will continue to have application. The, in terms of what these baseline offences are, the SAC recommended that the baseline offences are all of those offences that are currently defined as serious or significant offences under the Sentencing Act. In addition, uh, the SAC recommended that a number of other offences be included, uh, namely culpable and dangerous driving causing death, kidnapping, and the new offences that Trevor's already spoken about of intentionally and recklessly causing serious injury in circumstances of gross violence. Each of these offences will have a baseline level prescribed by legislation, which is essentially a number of years of imprisonment, which is said by Parliament to reflect the objective seriousness of that offence. Now, the SAC recommended uh, particular baseline levels for each of those offences, and I've listed some of those by way of example at, uh, in, in the paper. So, for instance, uh, murder will have a baseline level of 20 years, manslaughter or rape, 10 years, culpable driving, 9 years, armed robbery, <coughs> intentionally cause serious injury in gross violent circumstances, eight years, and so on. The way the scheme will work in basic terms is essentially that firstly, as I've already said, the court will have to decide whether, on the circumstances of the case before it, the court will impose a custodial sentence with a non-parole period. Once that decision is made, if the offence is one of these baseline offences, the court will have to use that baseline level as the starting point for determining the sentence. The next step is that the court will then be able to adjust that baseline figure, in other words, move up or down from that starting point, to take into account the aggravating and mitigating features that are present in the case, including uh, a plea of guilty if there is one. And based on a synthesis of all of those factors, the court will determine what SAC called an adjusted baseline. This adjusted baseline will then become the non-parole period. And then finally, the final step is that the court will then determine a head sentence. From that um, process that I've just described in very basic terms, it will already be apparent to you that this represents really quite fundamental uh, departure from the current way that uh, courts sentence in this state. Firstly, it's fundamental and quite strange in that it requires a court to set a non-parole period first before it considers a head sentence. Secondly, it arguably introduces a two-stage approach to sentence and therefore departs from the instinctive synthesis approach which has been consistently applied in Victoria and endorsed by the High Court. Uh, in the paper, I've referred to a couple of High Court cases of uh, Wong and the Queen and McCarran and the Queen, where the High Court has cautioned against a two-stage approach to sentencing. I won't read out those quotes, but essentially what the High Court has said on these occasions and others is that the instinctive synthesis approach to sentencing, as we all know, requires a court to take into account all relevant factors, many of which pull in different uh, directions, and arrive at a sentence which incorporates all of those competing considerations. By contrast, a two-stage process, 
which arguably this is, requires the court to single out one of those considerations, namely the objective seriousness of the offence, and gives that consideration greater prominence than all of the other factors. Justice McHugh, in the case of McCarian, suggested that a fundamental defect with, defect with that process is that by concentrating on that one factor, the objective seriousness of the offence, the judge gives effect to and greater weight to the retributive or deterrent theory of sentencing and consciously or unconsciously, the judge who commences with a notional or starting point in sentence downplays the importance of mitigation, reformation and rehabilitation in the sentencing process. Apart from these problems in principle, which, which I obviously don't discount, they're fundamental, the scheme that's been proposed by the uh, SAC will give rise to some real problems in practice. And in my paper I've outlined um, some of those. The first real issue, and this is in fact identified by SAC, is the situation of what happens when you've got multiple offences on an indictment, which let's face it is usually the case when we're dealing with these sorts of offences. And what uh, baseline offence you actually choose as the starting point. In some cases you will have uh, multiple baseline offences on an indictment, for example aggravated burglary which has got a baseline level of seven years and rape which has a baseline of ten years. And in other cases you'll have a combination of some baseline offences and some non-baseline offences. For instance, if you've got ag agberg and intentionally cause injury. <coughs> the process that SAC recommended courts follow in cases that involve multiple offences would require a court to identify a base sentence offence. In other words, it re would require the court to ask, well, what's the most serious offence or criminal behaviour in this case? And the answer to that question would determine which baseline level, if any, applies. So, for example, in the Agberg and rape situation, if the court finds that, well, the most serious offending in that case is the rape, perhaps it's a technical Agberg, but the rape's really the, the gravamen of the offending, then the court would uh, have to start with the 10-year baseline as the starting point and then determine the adjusted baseline in the way that I've described, taking into account mitigating and aggravating features. In cases where the indictment includes offences which are baseline and non-baseline offences, the SAC recommended that the scheme have no application at all. So that's quite useful. It may well encourage uh, you or your clients to uh, make sure you have a, a non-baseline sentence in the indictment before you plead in order to escape the application of, uh, of this scheme. Um, just briefly, there's also other practical implications which um, I refer to in my paper and I'll just speak to in very brief form, but clearly the introduction of this scheme is likely to add greater complexity and length to plea and sentencing hearings, particularly in cases where you've got multiple offences. Courts are going to have to make decisions about which, if any, baseline level applies, and they're going to have to engage in this somewhat mathematical um, approach of adjusting the starting point in order to reach the appropriate sentence. It's also likely to have impacts in terms of plea negotiations because um, you're going to want to make sure that um, the Crown is quite clear, perhaps before a plea is entered, as to whether it says uh, the baseline scheme applies at all. And if so, 
when you've got multiple baseline offences, which starting point they say applies. In other words, which is the more serious offence, would they say, in the circumstances. The other fundamental problem with this scheme is that its intention is clearly to result in people spending more time in prison, which of course would lead to an increased prison population, which as we all know is not something that this state could uh, accommodate at any time in the near future. Interestingly, the government actually asked SAC to provide some projections on the anticipated increase in prisoner numbers. Um, and the SAC has done that as best, best it could and indicated that it, in its view, the greatest increase in prisoner numbers is likely to be seen some seven to 11 years after this scheme comes into play because it's um, envisaged that that's the stage when really the extra years on the end of non-parole periods are likely to, to kick in and have the greatest impact. Finally, as I've said, this um, baseline sentencing scheme is designed to operate in conjunction with the current approach to sentencing that we have. So it's really, in my view, quite unsatisfactory that we'll end up having two different sentencing approaches in this state, uh, depending on the offences that a person is facing and whether those charges are proceeding indictably or um, summarily. Finally, um, I note that it's really not quite clear how this scheme will operate in conjunction with the statutory minimum sentencing scheme for offences involving gross violence that Trevor has already um, spoken to you about. The gross violence offences themselves have a baseline level uh, of eight years for intentional and seven years of recklessly causing serious injury in circumstances of gross violence. So it's really going to be quite an extraordinary exercise, I would suggest, to, uh, to have both a baseline and a statutory minimum operating um, in the same proceedings. Thanks for listening and we'll have some time for questions at the very end. Mm -hmm.